Let me move back briefly to the bigger historical implications of stories such as this one. Did rural Chinese women have a revolution? And if so, what kind of revolution and when? The stories we heard from women reflected a more distant relationship than that of men to what I call the campaign time of the state, where men would recite to us a series of political changes, more or less in textbook order, and it made me feel great because they spoke something closer to standard Chinese and I could understand the vocabulary. Um, women were far more likely to scramble calendar years and reorder or rename events. For older rural women, Western calendar years have little meaning. If you ask many village women about the succession of campaigns by which the state organized time in the Mao era, they recognize names such as mutual aid, aid teams, lower producers cooperatives, etc. but many of them scramble the order or rework the elements. For example, if we asked about the Great Leap Forward, women all understood the term, but in their replies, they seldom used it. Instead, they talked about the campaign as the time when we smelted steel or the time when we ate in collective dining halls, a policy measure in which people smashed their kitchen stoves, melted down their pots <coughs> for steel, and ate in public dining halls where a day's work was required for a day's food, and where a few months of glorious eating were succeeded by several years of government-induced famine. In short, in their use of language, women disaggre disaggregated the campaign and the famine into concrete elements that affected their daily lives. Um, Professor Hershetta, uh, thank you for your talk tonight. Uh, I think from the stories you told us just now, um, we get the sense that actually the history of these women are more about bodily temporary, uh, very t temporal, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, um, than uh, the events of um, which has related more to the state. So mm -hmm. my question here is, uh, well, uh, how, can you tell us more about uh, how can we actually rethink the role of nostalgia in history if we're thinking about bodily uh, concepts and bodily ideals, mm -hmm. which is very often an ongoing process in women's life, and there can't really be a rupture among events. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think this is possibly a slight danger of the way I organized this talk and have organized the work, that you could get the idea that women are living in some kind of sub-historical or ahistorical state, you know, dealing only with cyclical time or the birth of their children or so forth. And that's not, uh, so let me correct that misimpression, which I think I probably left you with. All of these people have a strong sense of historical change, and although they may not articulate it as a result of the Chinese state, in many ways it is. For instance, Many of them had grown up before 1949 in a scene where there were many different armies marching in and out of the landscape. This area was not occupied by Japan, but there were nationalist armies and warlord armies and communist armies and, you know, sometimes switching back and forth day by day, uh, not to mention bandits who overlapped with soldiers quite a lot. And so their memories of childhood are memories of intense, uh, you could call it bodily, but intense physical insecurity and sexual menace. Um, and especially because a lot of them came from really poor families where uh, normatively young women are supposed to stay home prior to marriage and not work out in the fields. But in fact, a lot of the men were gone. They'd been conscripted. They'd left to look for work. If anyone was going to do the farming and anyone was not going to starve to death, women had to go out and do all of that work. So there's an intense insecurity that attends to their stories of childhood and young adulthood. Um, after 1949, I think they move around in collective space much more than would have been considered normative or safe before 1949. And the fact that they're working in collective agriculture means that they had often intensive kinds of relationships with other women their age in the village with whom they labored every day rather than just seeing a, um, a family assemblage as they might have at some other time. So that's another way in which historical time is marked. But if you go in with a set of temporal markers that have to do with um, land reform, marriage reform, lower producers' cooperatives, upper producers' cooperatives, people's commune, great leap forward, some of that is just, um, as I said when I was talking about the old society, it's, it's state language, 
people take it up if they think it's useful to them, and they leave it sitting there if they don't, and they take it up very unevenly. And the ways in which women take it up are very much shaped by how they spent every day, all day, working in the fields with other women and then going home to do all of this other domestic work at night. So it's not that they're outside of history. It's that they are in a historical scene in a gender-specific and also generationally-specific way. So thank you for asking, because otherwise, yeah, I could, you could walk away th with the impression that it's only about the Chinese zodiac and the kids and that it goes around in circles. It doesn't go around in circles.